Hello, BookTube. I have a little mail for you today. A bright, sunny start to the weekend. Uh, uh, no boxes, but a bunch of packages and also a periodical, The New New Yorker. The war comes to the cover of The New Yorker. Always a grim sign when you see that. Uh, I naturally went into this New Yorker with a lot of trepidation, considering what yesterday's Esquire experience was like. I will now have to wonder, when I open any major glossy magazine that I've subscribed to forever, is the magazine going to personally insult me? Am I going to have to stop reading it? <laughs> but that did not happen in this issue, and there was quite a bit uh, in here that was really good. One uh, letter at the beginning really annoyed me. Uh, this happens all the time. Uh, these kinds of things happen all the time. Uh, the letter was in response to an article about um, battery-powered vehicles, electricity and, and battery-powered vehicles, and how good they would be for the environment in the long run. And the author writes, uh, Seabrook's article on electric pickups overlooks a significant challenge to EV adoption, areas that lack not only charging infrastructure, but also wireless network coverage. I own a property in upstate New York. I have to take a boat across a river to get there. The boat landing where I park my truck does not have power and is 15 miles from cell service. The experience of arriving in the middle of a cold, dark, rainy night with a low battery that couldn't be charged on site combined with the inability to use an app to find nearby compatible chargers, would be, as Seabrook notes in his own northward journey on a dwindling battery, neither seamless nor delightful in the least. EV technology may be improving swiftly, but the lack of wireless coverage in rural and remote areas has to be addressed before most people living there will consider an electric pickup to be safe and reliable option. And notes like that. Uh, always tend to bug me. <laughs> I mean, the the underlying point is no doubt well taken. Uh, but there's always a note like that. When a subject of electric cars or any such thing comes up, there's always a note of someone, say, well, so, someone saying, well, what about me? I own a remote property that I have to cross the river Styx to get to, and it's in the woods, and it's always raining, and, and what about me? When 99% of people who, who should be considering electric rechargeable cars aren't in such a position it just and notes of caution like that always happen always in every subject and it always bugs me because it's a it's a species of dirty pool you want to recognize that you're the outlier and live with it lump it in other words for the good of everybody else for the good of the planet you ought to do that or for the for the good of everybody else for instance when it comes to wearing masks during a deadly pandemic where uh, where you can you, you'll inevitably get someone who will write a, a pompous letter to the editor saying, well, you know, my infant baby has X pulmonary disease that two people on earth have, and if he wears a mask, he will die instantly. Why do you want me bereaved of my child? Why is it that you want my child dead? <laughs> when the, the response to a one in a billion shot like that is shut up and lump it, <laughs> you know, will uh, my heart goes out to you, but let's figure out a way to address your specific case rather than allowing your incredibly rare, weird scenario to dictate everybody else. Uh, the, the, that sort of thing always bugs me, but that was the only thing that bugged me in this issue, aside from the fiction, which was terrible. Uh, the, Lawrence Wright, for instance, uh, the author of The Looming Tower and uh, The End of October and The, the, the Plague Years, a uh, good nonfiction writer, has a great piece here that I only wish he would expand on. Uh, it's called The Elephant in the Courtroom. And it's about one particular elephant, but it's also about the legal rights that we give to non-humans. It's about that subject, uh, and that subject is fascinating to me. I wish that it could get more traction than it ever does because it's long since overdue. Uh, that that subject is fascinating to me because we do it all the time. It's not it's not like uh, detractors of the idea say that if you were to give pigs, for instance, or the idea that's most often often brooded would be uh, apes like ourselves, chimpanzees, bonobos orangutans, gorillas, giving them some sort of legal rights, or all legal rights. The, the, the dumb uh, naysayers will always say things like, well, what's the chimpanzee supposed to do? Represent himself in court? What's he going to do if the judge if the judge overrules him? Throw feces? I, I never know what to say to such people. It bothers me that so many of them are fundamentally Christian, a fundamentalist Christian. I don't know why those two things should go hand in hand, but they tend to. I always want to say, have you ever seen a baby open a briefcase in court? No, you haven't. 
Do babies have legal rights? Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. Have you ever seen a, a very old person, a sick person, in a care home, on tubes, unable to walk? Have you ever seen them totter into a courtroom and represent themselves? No, you haven't. Do they have legal rights? Yes, they do. We do this all the time. All the time. For the last 500 years at least or more. Uh, there's there's plenty of evidence in ancient times that, that legal protections were given to imbecilic children, to retarded children. That, that There's plenty of evidence that compassion overruled the, the niceties of the law and extended legal protections to such people, as well it should. So the, uh, the objection, if it is that, that the, they don't understand the legal protections that they have makes no difference. It, it doesn't hold water at all. Unfortunately, it's... it's uh, it's only glanced at in this article. This article is actually a very intelligent a dissection of the subject and doesn't go far enough. Uh, elephants, sure, they're big, they're charismatic, they have obviously demonstrated for the last 50 years, even to the most skeptical mind, that they have compassion, that they have a sense of self, that they have a sense of community, that they have a culture that they can pass on from generation to generation, that they have uh, bad moods, good moods, a sense of self-preservation, a sense of altruism. They've demonstrated those things forever and ever and ever. It, Hannibal knew them. So, the, yes, the elephant at the center of the story here is, can we establish some legal rights for this one performing elephant to maybe give him a retirement, a, a nice, kind, ethical retirement? Can we do that? Can we plead on his behalf for that as a legal right even though he doesn't understand English and can't go into the courtroom. And the, if you in any way come close to answering that question with yes, well, then you already know where that goes and you know where the opposition to it will come from because all the things that I just mentioned about elephants, sense of self, sense of self-preservation, altruism, a sense of caring, a sense of fear of their own death, all that sort of stuff, we now know, science has now demonstrated conclusively that Tons of animal species feel all of those things, experience all of those things, all of them. <laughs> and if they do, if it's not just dolphins and elephants anymore and our fellow apes, if it's not, if it's not just that little club anymore, if it's lots and lots of different species, well then, the minute you establish a legal precedent to defend one of them in a courtroom and give them any kind of inalienable rights, you have established a precedent to do that for all of them. I guarantee you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, beyond a shadow of a doubt, there isn't a pig in the world who wants to die. <laughs> and there isn't a pig in the world who doesn't know he's going to die when his ten friends die right before him one room away. They're not wind-up toys, right? They know what's happening. I can t testify firsthand that dogs in an animal shelter know exactly what's happening when the man from the state comes around to euthanize them. They know exactly what's happening, and they don't want it to happen to them. They don't want that to happen to them. Do we need any more self-awareness than that to extend them the benefit of the law? I would say no. I would say no, that we don't. But uh, it's a fascinating article anyway. If you actually shell out through the nose, the New Yorker's not cheap, but if you shell out through the nose for the New Yorker, don't miss that article. Definitely don't. And also this one. This article as well, uh, really, really good. Louis Menon does a long piece on Charles Dickens uh, that is uh, technically about uh, this thing. It's technically about this book, which we just saw on this channel. Uh, but it's really, in classic Menon style, it's really just about Dickens and has a lot of really good, really good stuff in it, uh, including, I wonder if I can, I close the magazine, I, if I, can, I can quickly get to his conclusion. His conclusion was fantastic. I didn't see it coming. I think that helped me to really like it. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, this, in a way, is a solution to the problem of reading Dickens. The reason the books are melodramatic is that they are melodrama. If you're looking for something else, read Anthony Trollope. The best generic counterpart to Dickens is the Broadway musical, where feelings are splashed with color, where people dance and break into song, where every complication can be magically resolved by showing a little heart, and all join hands in the final curtain. As hokey as it seems in the cold light of day, Broadway audiences suspend their skepticism for the pleasure of the performers and the spectacle. 
That's really good. I really like that. Uh, but anyway, that was the periodical. That was the New Yorker. Good Lord. That was a nice long examination of the New Yorker. Some of you have told me that you like that, that you like a, an in-depth examination of these magazines because you don't take them yourself, but you are still curious about what's in them. So I'm hoping that this will be my defense for now. Now we'll move on to uh, to the books. No no boxes this time around, but we'll see, see what kind of other goodies we can find here. Uh, okay. Uh, what is this? Oh, right. I think I heard from this. I think I heard about this from a publicist. This is from Texas Review Press. Uh, I don't know what Texas Review Press is. It sounds like it's the press associated with a journal called the Texas Review. And if that's true, well, uh, I've never written for the Texas Review. <laughs> I might like to. Uh, let's see what we have here. This is a little weird. I don't know if this is uh, what this is actually going to look like. I'd almost, be, I'd almost like it if it were, but I doubt it. I think this is just a bound galley. This is Pictures of the Shark a collection of short stories by Thomas McNeely. And it came to me in a spiral bound uh, that I'm, I'm just assuming that this is their version of taking it down to Kinko's and having it bound, of having just the loose pages bound. Uh, let's see here. This comes out in June and will be $21.95. Uh, let's see here. It's a beautifully crafted collection of urban Texas stories. A sudden snowfall in Houston reveals family secrets. A trip to Universal Studios to snap a picture of a shark from Jaws becomes a battle of wills between father and son. A midnight seance and the ghost of Janis Joplin conjure the mysteries of sex. In this collection, the author moves from the surreal world of childhood into the wider arenas of sex, addiction, art, and ambition. Appearing in the country's finest literary journals, including Plowshares, the Virginia Qu Quarterly Review, Epoch, and Crazy Horse, shortlisted for the O. Henry Award, Best American Short Stories and the Pushcart Prize Collection, the stories from Pictures of the Shark are gems that refract their characters' complex relationships. Okay. Uh, all right. That, that sounds really good. I, I don't know that your copy's going to have spiral bats. I'm going to keep this one. Uh, so who is the author when he's at home? Thomas McNeely is an East Side Houston native. He's published stories and nonfiction in The Atlantic, Techless Monthly, Plowshares, and many other magazines. He received a National Endowment for the Arts, Wallace Stegner, and McDowell Col Fe Colony Fellowships for his fiction. Good Lord. So a lot of people have thought really highly of this guy's fiction. I don't think I've read anything by him. Uh, his first book, Ghost Horse, won the Gival Prize Novel Award and was shortlisted for the William Saroyan International Prize in Writing. And he currently teaches the Stanford Online Writing Studio and at Emerson College in Boston. Oh, my. <laughs> so he teaches... This is right nearby. All right. Very good. Uh, so, all right. So that is uh, Pictures of the Shark. And what was the, the date on this again? It comes out in June uh, at $22. Interesting. I wonder if it'll be, even if you don't have the uh, the spiral bound, I wonder if the copy that is available in stores will be this smaller size. That would be kind of distinctive. Uh, anyway, great. Okay. So uh, short fiction. Uh, let's move on here. Let's see. I don't think there's any chance that we're going to finish the uh, the week as we started it with an all-fiction mail haul, but let's see. Oh, okay. All right. This next one is a double. Uh, this comes out in late June. This is The Golden Acre by Philip Miller. Uh, we saw this already, but let's hear about it again. Uh, equipped with an impressive background as both a poet and a formal journalist, Philip Miller is an exact, exciting voice in the intersection of literary and crime fiction. Uh, a testament to his poetic artistry, his lush, pensive writing in the Golden Acre conjures vivid imagery worthy of the famous artwork and city, which itself comes to life as a beautiful, mysterious, and even sinister character at the heart of the story. Uh, at the center of this book are two major investigations, neither particularly interested in rectifying a crime, but both searching for truth in their own ways. Remember this? The two are totally unconnected until they get connected by events. On the one hand, there is art inspector Thomas Tallis. Uh, whose personal life is in shambles when he arrives in Scotland to authenticate The Golden Acre, a masterpiece by iconic Scottish architect and painter Charles Rennie Mackintosh. It should be a simple job, as the painting has been owned by one noble family since the 1920s. 
Uh, but when a horrifying parcel arrives on Talus's desk, it's clear that someone doesn't want him inspecting the painting. Uh, then there is Shona Sanderson, a bitter, a battle-hardened journalist hungry for glory in an industry that is shrinking around her. As gruesome murders plague Edinburgh, first a renowned painter and next a city councillor, she jumps on the case in search of gripping headlines. She doesn't care who she steps on to get the best story, and she soon discovers a link between the Golden Acre and the murders, which also links her with Thomas Dallas. So this, uh, this is a little too late for March Mystery Madness, but I will be gobbling it up anyway. Uh, this comes out in, at the end of June. I'll be gobbling it up, but I will be waiting. I'm not going to... I have way too many March murder mysteries to read a June one uh, this month. Uh, but let's keep going. Let's, let's just push on here. Uh, two fiction items so far. Let's see what this next one is. Uh, oh, hi. All right. Next one's a Penguin Classic. Very nice. Uh, oh, 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 I'm not just any Penguin Classic. Oh, oh my. <laughs> Someone go on to the bocce ball court and get Tom of Tom L.A. Books to come inside for a minute. <laughs> this is, I, I believe I mentioned this to you already. This is translated by Virginia Jewess, and this is a new translation of Dante's La Vida Nuova with a parallel text. So unlike, unlike many Penguin classics, you get, you get a parallel text of, uh, look at that. Fantastic. Incredible. Uh, let's see what we have here. Let's, let's see. Let's see what we have here. Oh yeah. A ton of, it has a ton of blurbs already. Uh, it comes out at the end of this month, it comes out at the end of March. Uh, and it was originally published in 1294. It, the, an elusive work of early work of Italy's most renowned poet. Preceding the Divine Comedy, it is in these pages that readers are first introduced to Beatrice, the young woman who enraptured the poet and inspired his greatest works. Loving her for the rest of his life with a devotion undim, undiminished by her untimely death, in fact, enhanced by that untimely death, Dante would dedicate to himself to transfiguring her through poetry into something far more than a muse. She would become the very proof of love as transcendent spiritual power and the adoration of her a radiant path into a new life. Oh my. All right, so let's find out about the translator. Virginia Jewess is a Dante scholar and a translator with a PhD in Italian literature from Yale, where she taught for many years before joining the faculty at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and her, she has translated works by Pirandello, uh, Roberto Saviano. I wonder if she translated uh, the Piranhas. I wonder if she's the translator of that work. Uh, Melania Mazzucco, Paolo Sorrentino, and Matteo Garone. And she divides her time between Rome and Washington. Fantastic. Okay, so this comes out at the end of this month uh, from Penguin. A new parallel text edition of La Vina Nuova. Unbelievable. Fantastic. All right. Fantastic. I, I don't know that this mail is going to be able to top that. Uh, but we'll, we'll certainly give it a try. I'm up, I'm up for it if you are. Uh, let's see what this next one is. Oh, my God. This next one is also fiction. Oh, my God. All right. Uh, okay. So this comes out in May. So a while from now. Unfortunately, because it would fit for March Mystery Madness. I've recommended this author many, many times. I will be happy to recommend again. This is uh, the new novel by Mick Herron. This is called Bad Actors. Let's get my fingers where I won't be blocking the rather nice cover artwork. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, well, I don't want to hear about Netflix. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to hear about Netflix. Uh, let's let's see. Oh, they're, they're, of course, pushing uh, the fact that Apple TV is adapting his Slow Horses series. That, that's, that'll be a lot of fun. I think Gary Oldman is in it. That, that'll be a lot of fun. That's a great series. Uh, but what, what have we got here? Truly, it is a golden age for fans of Mick Herron. On May the 10th, Herron returns readers to the politically prescient and mordantly funny world of Slow House in his new novel, Bad Actors. He spent 10 years rewriting the spy thriller for the modern era. Gone are the gadgets, or pro patria mori, that define such classics as Fleming's Casino Royale and Le Carre's The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. Oh, okay, pro patria mori. At least, typically, I don't know what the writer of this public, the publicity sheet has in mind, but typically that phrase refers to mindless patriotism. And there's none of that. 
in the spire came in from the cold i don't know if the person who wrote this has read that book uh but anyway let's let's just press on instead heron gives readers something more appropriate for the times bureaucracy corporatism and above all careerism the spy masters at m at m i uh at m i five uh spend more time jockeying for a better desk than figuring out just what russia is trying to do and for the heroes, Heron has devised a truly delightful rogues gallery of state security cast-offs. The literal misfits of Slow House, a.k.e. the Slow Horses, are often the last and or only line of defense against nefarious plots, both foreign and domestic. They're often the last to know, too. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Well, I don't need more than that. I, I would suggest going back to the very first book in the series and starting there especially if it's going to get waved under your nose as an Apple Plus TV show. I don't know how many people subscribe to Apple Plus. Uh, that's the problem with the, with living now in the world of subscription services. It, it was different when it was just Showtime and uh, when it was just HBO, Showtime, and Cinemax. Now, literally everything has its own subscription service, and you can't subscribe to all of them, especially since in most cases you'd be subscribing for one thing only. Uh, so I don't know how many of these shows are just plain getting missed is what I'm saying. And that would be a shame because I'm sure that a huge amount of creativity is going into them. But I don't, for instance, have Apple Plus TV. I will immediately go scrounging around for uh, a screener. But how many people have that option? Virtually nobody. Uh, and then we'll do this uh, this last thing, which is, well, it's in rough shape. It's It's been battered and beaten and barely reached me. It's fairly heavy. It could be a finished copy. I'm glad that the package didn't just blow apart and leave me with nothing. I hate that. I absolutely hate that. When the post office, say, they when they deliver the empty envelope <laughs> wrapped in plastic with a banner that says, we care. <laughs> it's just like, we're taunting you and we know it. Uh, you have to be very careful with these packages because they're full of asbestos. Let's, let's be very careful with this so that we don't... Okay, it is one book and it's big. It's a big book, whatever it is. I want to be careful. Not only that that doesn't spill here, but that it doesn't get anywhere near where my little baby can get at it. Although, thankfully, I should say, just as a digression, one of many, <laughs> Frida doesn't seem to care about such things. I, those of you who are dog people will know you have to take elaborate precautions to make sure they don't put things in their mouths that they shouldn't, make sure they're not chewing on things that they shouldn't. Frida has no interest in that whatsoever, not just in the house, but outside as well. I had 15 years of a my pointer mailing eight something usually a lot on every walk that we went on of her entire life she knew it displeased me and i kept an eye out and she still managed to do it every single time sometimes little things sometimes big things sometimes rocks just because she had that compulsion to grab carrion off the ground and and you with both her and my basset hound lucy there was no way that i could trust them i had to make sure that things were dog proofed all over the place not just for casual gnawing but also to get into food frida has no interest in doing any of that she not none whatsoever she just stares at food even even edible food on the sidewalk stuff that i have to stop and encourage us both to eat she'll pass it by if i don't do that she and same thing here she doesn't chew on anything she doesn't uh, except feet feet moving in her domain oh, she's not happy with that at all but wires or dropped snacks or anything like that no no not at all she she eats her food and the only other thing that she really likes to bite into is a live mouse <laughs> anyway uh, oh my what is this oh goodness it's a great big biography from the folks at oxford university press god though this asbestos is just everywhere <laughs> Jeez. i'm not gonna like breathing that in even as a healthy 28 year old why this couldn't go in a paper envelope or a padded envelope they sell them for 10 for a dollar at the, at the uh paper goods store uh, instead of i've got i'm oh, i'll clean it up on my own what i'm gonna have to do though is take a piece of clear plastic tape wrap it around my knuckles and get down on all fours and just tap all of this stuff up onto the tape a huge amount probably half an hour to clean up the mess of this one package uh but this is a huge biography uh it's covered in flaking asbestos but it's by lynn garafala and it's called Legin la nijinska choreographer of the modern it's God help us about ballet. New bloody ballet. <laughs> oh, God help us. Uh, so what have we got here? This is the first biography of the, 20, of the 20th century ballet's premier female choreographer, uh, Lanajinska. 
Overshadowed in life and legend by her brother, Nijinsky, Bronislava Nijinska had a far longer and more productive career than he did. An architect of, 21st, of 20th century neoclassicism, she experienced the transformative power of the Russian Revolution and created her greatest work under the influence of its avant-garde. Many of her ballets rested on the probing of gender boundaries, a mistrust of conventional gender roles, and the heightening of the ballerina's technical and artistic prowess. A prominent member of Russia abroad, she worked with leading figures of the 20th century art, music, and ballet, including Stravinsky, Diaghilev, Poulenc, uh, Alexandra Exter, Natalia Goncharova, Frederick Ashton, Alicia Markova, and Maria, and Maria Talchi. I'm wondering how many of those are dance figures. I stopped recognizing the names pretty early on. Uh, she was also a remarkable dancer in her own right, with a bravura technique and a powerful stage presence that enabled her to perform an unusually broad repertory. Oh, okay. So this is, and this is her first biography. I wonder if that's her first biography in English or her first biography ever. It's a great big thing. Uh, fantastic. Well, I'm not, I don't know anything about this subject. I don't know anything about this period. So this is going to be great. Uh, I also don't have a date for it, unfortunately. Uh, since it's an Oxford finished copy, there's a real good chance that this is out already. This is like, I could easily picture this being an early March, a March 1st release, something like that. I will have to check on the date, but I have a feeling this is going right to the top of the TBR for tonight. Uh, along with Lavina Nuova. I don't care when it comes out. <laughs> I want to read it again. I want to read the introduction and see what kind of a job the translator does. Uh, but anyway, that is the surprise of the day. Uh, Lena Zinska. Uh, then we have Mick Heron, Bad Actors. We have the new, a new Penguin Classic dual language edition of the Vita Nuova. We have another copy of Golden Acre. Uh, and we have uh, Pictures of the Shark, Stories by Thomas McNeely, uh, coming out in June. Uh, plus the latest New Yorker with a tank on the cover. Uh, so that is, your, that is your mail for today. All of this came very, very early. I've now got a huge cleanup to do. Just I've got asbestos flakes flying everywhere here. They all need to be aired out and tamped down and bagged up and put away. I will I see the see the uh, the hardships that I endure on your behalf. <laughs> Booktube. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up for now. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.